Well, hello again, everybody. We're going to talk about the renal cell carcinoma here. It is not the highest yield cancer that you're going to run into, but it is very important because it is on our differential of hematuria, which actually is a fairly common complaint. So this is important for you to know just as part of your differential diagnosis. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description below or in the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. Okay, so this is kind of our uh, preview here. Uh, we're gonna do a quick overview so you get a general idea of what we're talking about. I'm gonna show you some imaging uh, that will help you. It may come up on your exam. Uh, we'll do uh, how we go over a workup for renal cell carcinoma, and then uh, a little bit about the management that's lower yield for the exam, and you'll see why, uh, and then we'll do a recap. Renal cell carcinoma refers to a set of malignancies that arise from the cortex of the kidney or the parenchyma. It is by far and away the most common uh, malignant neoplasm that comes from the kidney. A small minority of renal neoplasms arise from the renal pelvis. Those are transitional cell carcinomas, very similar to what we would see in the bladder, which remember is lined by transitional epithelial cells. Now, there are a variety of renal cell carcinomas, but the vast majority are clear cell carcinomas, about 80% or so, and those will be the ones that come up on your exam. Now, this is where we run into problems. The majority of renal cell carcinomas, when they first develop, are asymptomatic and discovered incidentally. About 50% are discovered incidentally, meaning that the patient doesn't have any symptoms or they don't know that they have symptoms. Um, they may have microscopic hematuria, but you can't see that. Um, eventually, however, as this progresses, of course they'll develop symptoms. The triad of hematuria, flank pain, and abdominal mass, palpable abdominal mass, which you probably learned about in medical school, it doesn't present as a triad very commonly. Only about 10% of cases, and those cases tend to be advanced. So by the time you're developing gross hematuria, by the time you are able to feel this mass, it's likely very late in the course of the cancer. The most clearly established modifiable risk factor is smoking. That is commonly tested, but it's only about a 30% increased risk. So it's not the same risk that smoking causes for lung cancer, uh, but it is a risk factor. It is modifiable, and it's one of the reasons that you should not smoke. Uh, males are more likely to get this than females by about two to one, uh, over 55 most of these patients are elderly. Uh, however, I did go to medical school with a guy who, you know, I'm guessing was in his 30s, and he had renal cell carcinoma in his 20s. Uh, black or Native American ancestry, obesity, very common, hypertension, very common, a family history of renal cell carcinoma, and then a couple of these inherited disorders, von Hippel-Lindau, so remember the hemangioblastomas of the CNS, pheochromocytomas, neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas, and then tuberous sclerosis. You probably haven't seen that since step one, but remember that's the angiofibromas of the skin, um, especially of the face, um, cardiac rhabdomyomas, chagrin patches, um, and then uh, in the kidney, it usually causes cysts or angiomyolipomas, but it does absolutely increase your risk for, uh, for, for renal cell carcinoma. And then, of course, you can't forget uh, with tuberous sclerosis, you can also see those cortical masses, and they may have uh, seizures. Renal cell carcinoma uh, is a renal mass, and not all renal masses are malignant. So if you do come across a mass in the kidney, you have to be prepared to figure out whether this is benign or malignant. Now, in many cases, we're going to do a really good workup. Uh, however, there are indicators um, as to whether what you're dealing with is more likely benign or more likely malignant. Um, so... Uh, the majority, however, of solid renal masses are in fact malignant. So if you have a small renal mass, meaning a mass of the kidney less than four centimeters, 
it is more than likely malignant. If it's under two centimeters, 75% of the time it's malignant. Only 25% are benign. But the smaller you get, the more likely it is to be benign. So once you get, if, if it's under one and a half centimeters, it's about a 50-50 chance, a coin flip, that what you're dealing with is malignant. So the bigger the mass is, the more likely it is to be cancer. We staged this using the TNM classification. Don't worry about staging renal cell carcinoma. Okay, so if a flank mass is identified on physical exam, then the best initial test is an ultrasound. And you can see the features here. Uh, benign, they tend to be smaller, they tend to be hypoechoic, and they tend to have well-defined margins. Whereas malignant, they tend to be larger, uh, more solid or complex, they may be lobulated, and they tend to have either irregular margins or poorly defined margins. If a flank mass, however, is identified on ultrasound, so you have a patient who comes in with palpable flank mass, you do an ultrasound, you see the mass on ultrasound, then your next step is a CT. But remember, the majority of these cancers are detected uh, on imaging in an asymptomatic patient. And many of those cases, you'll be doing a CT because it's rare for us to do a renal ultrasound for no reason. Uh, so... Um, when you do a CT, you have to make sure it is with contrast. There's something called a renal protocol. You don't need to know what that is. Uh, but a contrast CT is very specific and very, very sensitive for uh, renal cell carcinoma. So uh, that is going to be important. Make sure it's a contrast CT. If they are uh, renally insufficient or they're allergic to contrast, then you can do an MRI, but we don't recommend that in all patients just for cost reasons. All right, so here is what a kidney looks like on ultrasound. I'm going to switch to red here. You can see these nice, well-defined borders of the kidney. You can see the cortex here and the pelvis here. All right, so what do you see here? Well, you see this mass on the what appears to be the superior lobe of or superior pole of the uh, kidney. And notice how this is very hypo or even anechoic. It's got really nice margins here, and it's uh, fairly uniform. So this is, what do you think, benign or malignant? This is most likely benign. Now, how about this one? There's already an arrow pointing at it. So notice that this is very solid in appearance. Um, you also don't really see nice, well-defined margins and it kind of just spills into the surrounding tissue. So this is more than likely malignant. How about this one, benign or malignant? Likely benign. And how about this one? This is likely malignant. Again here, look, you can see some borders here, but look, you can't really see the borders uh, on the uh, kidney side. I can't tell if this is inferior or superior, uh, but you can see here though that, uh, that you, you've got uh, a solid mass, uh, relatively poorly defined margin, so this is probably malignant. And so is this one. Now this is CT, pretty much same rules apply. Okay, so our initial workup, we're gonna wanna get a routine lab, CBC, BMP. We wanna get a serum calcium. And the reason is because increased calcium is a perineoplastic syndrome of renal cell carcinoma. We wanna get liver function tests, LDH, a urinalysis, um, because we wanna look for protein area because that may uh, influence our treatment if it's metastatic and then any imaging that you haven't gotten yet. So if you have not gotten a CT yet, now is the time to do it. Further workup, we wanna get a CT of the chest in all patients looking for uh, metastasis to the lung. And then other imaging would be based on labs. So if there's an elevated alkaline phosphatase, that suggests the possibility of bony metastasis. If there are localized neurologic signs, then you want to get a brain MRI, but we don't need to do those in everybody. If there's evidence of metastatic disease, then you want to do a biopsy. However, we don't need to do that in most patients, and I'll get to why that is. All right, so if you really geek out on oncology stuff, here you go. This is how it's staged. This is why you don't need to know it for the exam. So perineoplastic syndrome is fairly common in renal cell carcinoma. And as a matter of fact, this could actually be a presentation. 
Um, it would be very, very difficult to tease out renal cell carcinoma with some of these syndromes, uh, but it is something to keep in mind. So hypercalcemia of malignancy, you probably already know how that happens. It's from the release of PTH resembling peptide that's going to increase the serum concentration of calcium, and that can cause symptoms consistent with hypercalcemia, bone stones, moans, and psychiatric overtones. <laughs> My Minnesota accent comes out a little bit in that mnemonic. Um, so things like um, you may have kidney stones, or you may have constipation, or you may have fatigue, or uh, things along those lines. Uh, hypertension, we don't exactly know why that happens, um, so you're just going to have to take that for granted. Both of these uh, will show up in 20% of renal cell carcinoma patients. Polycythemia, you probably can imagine due to increased release of EPO, most likely. Uh, polycythemia is a rare manifestation of renal cell carcinoma. Most patients with renal cell carcinoma are anemic, and they would be anemic due to constant blood loss through the urine, as well as um, other causes that we associate with cancer, like increased inflammation, anemia of chronic disease, and so forth. Hepatic dysfunction is called Stouffer syndrome. This is usually asymptomatic, and we see it in uh, disturbances to the liver function test, which is why we get the liver function test. And um, this is not due to uh, met metastasis to the liver. Management, we want to address any underlying perineoplastic syndromes, uh, refer these patients off to oncology, nephrology, and surgery as well. Uh, then the treatment is based on the stage. So you don't need to know how to treat a patient with renal cell carcinoma because the staging is so elaborate. Uh, but suffice it to say, smaller tumors that are confined to the kidney uh, can be treated with partial nephrectomy. And this is really useful uh, because we can preserve kidney function. Larger tumors or tumors that have spread to local lymph nodes, we generally do a radical nephrectomy. And this is, of course, unilateral. We're not taking out both. And then stage four, so metastasis, that is targeted immune therapy. And perhaps the most common drug for this is pembrolizumab. Remember that targets the program death receptor. And then we also, by the way, this is marketed as Keytruda. And then and we always add another drug to that. Uh, and that's often a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Those always end in nib. So like selatinib. Adjuvant chemotherapy is controversial, so don't worry about that. The estimated five-year survival is, as you can imagine, correlated to the stage. However, in renal cell carcinoma, it is very correlated to the stage. So early uh, cancers have a very favorable prognosis, over 90%, uh, whereas metastasized cancers, the median survival is only about a year to a year and a half. So to recap, RCC is a set of malignancies. Most of them are clear cell carcinomas. 90 to 95% of all kidney cancers are renal cell carcinomas. So most of them are clear cell carcinomas. Smoking is the most important modifiable risk factor. The triad, classically described as hematuria, flank pain, and abdominal mass, but they rarely present as the triad. Hematuria is the most common finding. The best initial test when you suspect renal cell carcinoma is the abdominal pelvic CT with contrast. Uh, however, you may go for a, a renal ultrasound first if you just feel the mass, okay? But like I've been saying, you often don't have a reason to do a renal ultrasound unless there's a mass. So in many instances, you may jump right to CT. It just depends on the imaging that you've already done and the level of suspicion that you have for renal cell carcinoma. Uh, biopsy is usually not necessary. We can confirm the diagnosis after we do a partial or a radical nephrectomy. Uh, renal cell carcinomas tend to be complex, solid, and larger, whereas cysts tend to be uh, anechoic, uh, hollow, and they may be smaller. Early stage renal cell carcinoma is treated with partial nephrectomy. Uh, with, if, if it's nodal positive, then you do radical nephrectomy, and if it's metastatic, we go for chemo. Cytotoxic chemotherapy is not very effective, um, so we do in, uh, targeted immune therapy, which has dramatically increased the survival, uh, five-year survival for patients with advanced metastatic renal cell carcinoma.